if you have your Bibles, I want you to take them out and get ready to turn to Isaiah, the 14th chapter. I want to speak to you for a moment today on this topic, and I'm, I'm going to teach a little, preach a little, and give life lessons. Everybody say life lessons. So I encourage you, if you've got a pencil and paper, to take them out. There's some things that you need to write down to remember to live by. It's kind of like a compass. You know, how many of you have ever heard a map? Let me say it that way. You remember when you had to read a map? I thought, boy, if Siri ever turns on us, we're all in trouble. You know, because I, 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 I was, this past week, I was in Birmingham, Alabama, and I was following Siri like she was my best friend, like a kid holding her mom, his mama's hand. She was taking me all through Birmingham, and I thought, boy, if this woman ever turns on me, I am in trouble. Because we forgot how to read a map. You know, how many of you even still have a map? You know, they, well, thank God that people have them. I got one, too. It's in my trunk. I never get it out. We've got to be able to read maps so we know where we're at, and that way we can tell when we're lost. Usually, we don't realize we're lost until after the fact, and we need to figure out how to get back on course. So, if you would, I want you to uh, pray with me this morning as we talk about there's no place like home. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your love. We just ask that you'd have your way today. Father, speak to our hearts, God, and help us to follow after you. Lord, with a God, just a, an abandonment, Lord, to ourselves, God, and trusting totally and completely in you. And we give you praise for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask someone to bring me a chair. Someone's bringing me one right now. All right. Everybody say it with me one more time. There's no place like home. Is that phrase familiar to any of you? Is it something you've ever heard before? Wave your hand if you've ever heard that phrase before. It, it comes from a story of a little farm girl that was in Kansas, and she ended up, thank you, she ended up running away from home only to discover that what she ran away from is what she needed all the time. Now, there were some other things in there. You know, there's a house that falls on a witch, and there's some flying monkeys, and there's a, you know, wizard that gets exposed as a fraud. But the theme of the story is there's no place like home. Everybody say that one more time. There's no place like home. I want to, you to understand that when that story was written, it may have been a new story, but that theme is thousands of years old, Amen. that there's no place like home. Here's life lesson number one. My welfare and well-being are not just connected to who I am and what I do, but it's also connected to and impacted by where I am. Everybody say it with me, where I am. Let me say it to you one more time. My welfare and well-being is not just connected to who I am and what I do. It's impacted by where I am. I want you to take a look at creation. I want you to look at how long God spends preparing the place. Five days preparing the place, one day preparing the person so where we're at has a huge impact on who we become let me say it to you this way it doesn't matter how much time you spend trying to get your self ready if you're not in the right place with God it's not going to matter are you with me it doesn't matter how much intelligence you possess, how wise you are, how much wisdom you exercise. If you're, in, if you're not in the right place with God, nothing else is going to matter. Great things happen when you're at the right place. Just ask Adam and Eve. 
Adam and Eve are at the right place. And how many of you are excited about putting your garden out this year? Well, look at those hands go up, man. You're all excited about being able to get out there and dig in that dirt and plow that hard ground and pick rocks up and pull weeds and get down there and get all hot and sweaty and dirty and woo. Do you know that Adam and Eve never planted a garden? God planted the garden they partook of. Adam and Eve found out, man, it's wonderful when you're in the right place. <laughs> I mean, when you're in the right place, God provided everything. They never had to turn a stone. They never had to lift a spade. They never had to pull a weed. It was all ready there for them. They didn't have to toil for anything until they forgot their place. And when they forgot their place, they lost their provision. I want you to hear what I'm saying today and understand the importance of it. You can't float your own boat. You don't get to pick and choose what you want and where you want it. There are some things you need to leave in the Father's hands. Because if we forget our place, we lose provision. Now, I want you to hear me. We need to boldly declare that there is no place like home. Okay, let me, let me preface some things here because some of you, you know, are looking at me like, are you kidding me? I don't want to go home. But, but see, your, your earthly house is different than your father's house. What you may have experienced in your earthly house or in your earthly home may have been tragic, and you're having a hard time trying to grasp that, and that's exactly what the devil tries to do is twist what God always intended for us to have so we can't identify his purpose and his plan for our life. So we get mixed up, and instead of recognizing that I want to be home, we run away from home. There's power in the house. Can I tell you? Just ask the girl in Kansas. What are you talking about? The house smashed the witch. Yeah. Let me say it to you this way. God's house is powerful enough to squash whatever evil is trying to take you out or trying to take you, you, you over if you stay and abide in his house, at his house place it's a place of power we need to de boldly declare there's no place like home but we can't do that if we minimize the importance of the place are constantly complaining about and criticizing the place are obsessed with just wanting our own place how many of you couldn't wait to move out She moved out and moved in with me. We were married at the time. Just a little note there that's important. But, see, sometimes we're obsessed with wanting our own place. I remember my older brother, you know, when he got 18 and he wanted to be out on my own. And he moved in with some of his buddies. They partied every night, man. I went to his house. There's more beer cans hanging around than you could shake a stick at bottles all over the place and he was woo until he found out that there wasn't provision in that place like there had been at home and he found out that all those buddies that he lived with weren't coming across where their share of the rent and they weren't keeping up their end of the bargain let me tell you something the world would invite you in and then chew you up and spit you out because it's not concerned about taking care of you it just wants to use you and then what happened is because of a slight mistake that the renter made or that the the you know thank you i knew there was a name for it that the landlord made daryl was shook up he didn't know what he was going to do and my dad went over there and looked at the contract and found out you're supposed to be 21 years old to sign that contract and daryl was only 18 so guess what? 
he's moving out and he's coming back home <laughs> if we minimize the place we'll never understand the power of it we'll lose the provision of it and this has been going on for thousands of years I want you to recognize this it's the very thing when you get obsessed with wanting your own place doing your own thing it's what caused Lucifer's fall look at Isaiah 14 verse 12 how you are fallen from heaven O shining star son of the morning you have been thrown down to earth you who destroyed the nations of the world for you said to yourself I will ascend to heaven and set my throne above God's stars I will preside on the mountain of the gods far away in the north I will climb to the highest heavens and be like the most high and he lost his place thrown down cast out I've often wondered and I, I, I said in the first service I'd never preach this because I, I don't have enough information about it but I've always wondered if I were able to talk to the devil and ask him if you could go back and do this all over again would you still walk away would you still give up what you had and discover that what you got now is going to torment you the rest of your life how many of you've ever wanted something so bad until you got it anybody my son thought he wanted a snake true story went out and bought a corn snake you know what I'm talking about paid for a snake went out and bought this snake and he, he he thought that was the coolest thing until that snake messed on his bed and he went oh I don't want this thing let me tell you something about God God's never rejected us over our mess Oh, you ought to give him a hand clap of praise for that. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? Can you imagine a mother that the first time the baby made a mess? Get rid of this kid. Look at that, picking it up by the foot, carrying it. No. My son that rejected that snake over the mess has a little boy now. Two, he's not quite two years old yet, and he made a mess big mess and Jonathan's got a weak stomach and as he started trying to deal with his son's mess he went oh whew. and little Dutch went whew. and and Jonathan said oh stinky and Dutch said dinky and he was laughing about the mess while the father's dealing with the mess I'm telling you sometimes we've been kicking up our heels and laughing and thinking we were riding high but thank God there's a father that won't leave us in our mess because let me tell you after about two or three months in your mess all your laughing's done buddy you're going to get a rash that destiny won't touch are you with me today I want to I, I want to take you now to the focus of our scripture reference today go with me to Luke 15 11 I'm reading from the NLT it says to illustrate the point further Jesus told them this story a man had two sons the younger son told his father I want my share of your estate now before you die so his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons a few days later this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land and there he wasted all his money in wild living about the time his money ran out a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve everybody say starve. how many of you know there's a difference between being hungry and starving before I get done today some of you are going to get hungry hang on you're not starving but when you're starving man all you can think about is food 
Your focus is food. This guy is starving, and he persuaded a local farmer to hire him. The man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs, and the young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. Usually, when this is preached, the emphasis is always focused on what happened. Today, that's not going to be my focus. Today, I'm not going to talk about what happened. I want to focus on when it happened and why it happened. Say it with me. When and why. The son, here's the why. The son let his feelings be dictators instead of indicators. He's allowing his feelings to control him. And let me just say this. Just because your feelings are real doesn't make them right. I said just because your feelings are real doesn't make them right. How many of you have ever had some feelings that you thought were right and end up being wrong? You know what I'm talking to? There's a lot of broken hearts, not just in this house, but in any house you go into because once upon a time, somebody felt something that they thought was, it was real, what they felt was real, but it wasn't right. And so then their heart gets broken. We wind up with babies that aren't wanted because somebody felt something that was real, but it wasn't right. And I'm telling you, if you allow your feelings to dictate to your life, you're going to be in a mess throughout your life. Everybody say they're just indicators, not dictators. He allowed the feeling of entitlement to control him. Let me talk to you about what entitlement is. Entitlement is when a person assumes he has a right to all the stuff because of the relationship with the person that earned it. Somebody should have shouted yes on that. Let me, let me say that to you one more time. Entitlement is when a person feels like they have a right to all the goods or the stuff because of the relationship with the person that earned it. Is anybody in the house today? Have any of you ever had an experience with, I'm not going to get into specifics here, but have any of you ever had a relative that felt like they had a right to all your stuff because of the relationship they had with you and they never earned it? I tell you right now that I would not be happy. Now, I'm, I, I am thrilled to let my son ha wear some of my shoes, and I'm thrilled to let him wear my coat. But if I come home and find out that he's emptied out my closet, I am not going to be happy. Why? Thank you. <laughs> I, when, when I go to, how many of you have ever gone to town and bought something good? You know what I'm talking about? Like ice cream. <laughs> Came home, put it in the freezer, tucked it in a corner, thought about it all day long, only to come in and find out that the ice cream is gone. It's not there any longer. My grandfather had a cure for all that stuff. We used to go visit them, and my dad would always buy groceries, but there was something about Grandpa's Pepsi Cola sitting in the refrigerator. That was when they were in bottles. And he'd have a Pepsi or an RC in the refrigerator, and I was a little kid, and I didn't. I'd go in there and grab that cold Pepsi and take a big swig out of it. Well, Grandpa broke me of that because Grandpa was chewing tobacco. And it wasn't long until I grabbed a hold of that bottle and found a floaty in there, and I didn't want any of that anymore. 
That was his. He earned it. <laughs> Don't allow your emotions to control you. Listen to what happened to the boy. The boy begins to declare, I want my share now. His father could have looked at him and said, why don't you go take a long walk on a short pier? I'm, 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 not, I'm writing you out of the will. I've seen it happen. But he didn't do that. Hear me. And we ought to thank God that he doesn't reward us or provide for us according to the way we act. Yes. <laughs> How many of you have ever acted up a time or two? Come on, if, you don't, if you're not truthful, I'm going to talk to the person sitting next to you and find out. You, you know what I'm talking about? We've all been there, right? We've all been to that place, but there's a God in heaven that knows us, that loves us, that created us in his image, that's got a place for us even when we're trying to run away from it. And he's saying, no, 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 I, I, I'm not going to allow you to lose out on everything that I have for you. Even when we aren't acting right Entitlement caused the boy to begin to act like he produced what his father provided. Give me my portion. Now I want you to hear this. The prodigal son's downward spiral didn't happen until he left his father's house. There's no place like home. When he left his father's house, it's when he lost out on provision. Oh, what you've got will last you a while, but it won't be enough to sustain you. And when storms come, it'll consume everything you've got and leave you empty. The boy is about to get a reality check. Have you ever had one? Wave your hand if you've ever had a reality check. I had a reality a check that I affectionately call, give me a break. It happened at a house we used to rent, and there was a pavilion that had been built on the property, and it had a porch swing. You remember those? Yes. And Debbie and I out there was just a swing, and that was before the song came out. We were just a swing, and while we were swinging, that little pavilion had tin on it to cover it. And... We were swinging, and then all of a sudden, the bolt, you know what I'm talking about, those bolts that screw into wood? It, it pulled out while we were swinging. Man, mid-swing, that, that swing just, boom, man, came down, hit my ankle. I am down rubbing my ankle, and I'm going, oh, man. When all of a sudden, the brick hit me in the head and broke. <laughs> Give me a break. And it did. There were bricks on top of that tin that had been holding the tin down. We didn't realize. And when that thing pulled out, it jarred that whole pavilion and caused one of those bricks to start teetering. I didn't know it was there. And I was griping about the pain I was experiencing. And then all of a sudden, I quit griping about what I had been experiencing. Because now what I was experiencing was so much worse than what I'd been going through. I get man, I, I do this on my head. I got a, I got blood all over my hand. I've got to go. My daughter jumps up. She's looking and she pointed at that brick and she said, "You don't hurt my daddy." <laughs> that didn't stop my head from bleeding. <laughs> Made me feel good, but it didn't stop my head from. But what are you saying? I'm saying, in spite of everyone around you that loves you, there's only one that can truly provide for you. There's only one place of provision, and it's in your father's house. It's in your father's house. This young man is about to have a reality check. He runs out of money, and a famine hits. And all of his friends that he'd been drying, drying that he had been buying drinks for are gone. 
How many of you ever discovered in life that you can have a big party as long as you're paying for it? And then when the money was gone, all the friends were gone, and he was left starving and alone. Here's his reality check. When he realized that his greatest desire was to have dinner with a bunch of hogs, and no one would let him. And in that moment, I can't help but think that something happened inside of him. And he looked in the distance back to the place and said, there's no place like home. No place like home. Life lesson number two. The son, what it wanted, everything at once. Here's a life lesson. God picks how he provides. Say it with me. God picks how he provides. Remember a guy by the name of Abraham had a son called Isaac. And they take off at God's instruction, and he's headed to make a sacrifice, and he's working his way up to a mountain. And, and on the way to the mountain, Abraham's not saying anything. He knows in his heart what he's supposed to do, but he's got his faith locked in. Isaac turns around and looks at him and said, Father... Here's the wood and the fire, but where's the lamb? And Abraham takes a deep breath and looks at his son and says, God will provide himself a lamb. I don't know how he's going to do it, but I know he's going. He looked at those men before they started up that mountain and said, I and the lad are going up, and I and the lad are coming back. I'm not coming off of this mountain with a dead promise. I'm going to hold on to the hand of God because I know at his house he provides. I haven't walked away from him. I haven't ran from him. I'm in a place of provision. I may not know how it comes, but I know he's going to bring it. Moses and the children of Israel. A million and a half, two million people taken off across the desert. There's nobody to phone. There's no Uber to bring them groceries. There's no Walmart to stop at. And all the people are hungry. And this is what they start saying. Would to God you'd left us in Egypt. At least there we had leeks and garlic. Man, when your idea of a good meal is onions and garlic, I'll still be your friend, but from a distance. When, when you start desiring the things of the world over the things of God, and hear me, because God picks how he provides, and you don't get the blueprint. Sometimes we're sitting there, all right, God, I'll do it, but lay it out here for me. I, I need to see it. I'm willing to do it, but you need to lay it out. Go, uh-uh, that's not how this works. This is a walk by faith. Uh, you're either going to trust me or you're not going to trust me. And when you trust, uh, uh, miraculous things happen when you're in the right place. Uh, all of a sudden, bread starts falling out of heaven. Uh, quails come flying in from no place. They're getting water out of rocks. I ain't never been able to do that. I had to go hunting my quail. I've never had quail. <laughs> Take your best shot. No, he, he picks how he provides. And he provides in miraculous ways. You remember a guy by the name of Elijah? God sends him to a brook during a famine. And he says, I'm going to take care of you down there famine going on he's drinking 
water out of a brick, but man, I, I need some grub. I need some food. And you know, I mean, in, in the usual course of events, people feed birds. How many of you got a hummingbird feeder out in your house? You buy birds, you throw it out in the yard. But when God gets involved, <laughs> birds feed people. <laughs> The miraculous happens when you're in the right place. Here comes a raven. We were talking about this in between services because uh, Alex was talking about when he was in Sunday school and he saw the raven had sirloin or like a, a porterhouse steak in its hand in its Sunday school class. And I thought, God, send me a raven. <laughs> My wife doesn't even do that stuff, man. I'm Porterhouse? And then he said, then he said something, he, he made a statement, he said, now I realize that ravens eat trash. I said, ho, 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 scratch that from your theology. Because God don't provide trash. <laughs> God provides porterhouse. All right, what's your favorite food? Shrimp? Whatever it is you like, he's bringing. What, what do you got? I'm saying the miraculous happens when we learn how to stay in the right place. Everybody say the right place. Let me say this to you, though. The greatest blessing of the house isn't its provision. It's a father's presence. Let me say it again. The greatest blessing of the house isn't its provision. It's a father's presence. Stand up a minute. Stand up just a second. It's okay. Take your time. You hear him? That's painful for him. See, sometimes we don't think about the father experiencing pain. Yes. Now, given God's not bothered with arthritis or high blood pressure or anything, any physical malady. Thank you. Leonard, thank you. But is it possible for God to experience pain? Do, do you believe that it's possible that we could break God's heart? Do you think the Father was without emotion when the Son walked off? When he just got up and left? Do you think it didn't hurt? to see his boy walk away when he knew what would happen. But there are some lessons you're only going to learn by experience. Some things that people can't talk to you and explain. We try, don't we? How many of you have ever tried to pour into your children so they don't repeat the same mistakes you did? Wave your hand at me. It's a, a desire of our heart. We don't want our children repeating the same mistakes. And your parents didn't want you repeating their mistakes. But the, the bottom line is that sometimes we just don't listen. And so we begin our journey away from the presence of the Father. And remember, the boy's downward spiral didn't start until he walked away from his father. The prodigal couldn't experience all the father had to offer, not because the father didn't know how to be a father. It's because he didn't know how to be a son. Let me say it to you one more time. I hope you're getting this stuff in your spirit if you're not writing it down. The father, the son, didn't experience all the father had, not because the father didn't know how to be a father. It's because he didn't know how to be a son. You see, sons are willing to be led. Look at Romans 8 and 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Sons know how to be led. 
The son was aggravated over his father's timeline. Can anybody relate to that? Let me put it in language you'll understand. Aggravated is over his father's timeline. How many of you ever got aggravated with your parents because you felt like you were ready to do something before they felt like you were ready to do something? Wave your hand at me. Debbie was two years old. Two years old. And at two years old, she keeps saying she was almost three. Almost three, but she was still two. And that's just like a two-year-old wanting to be three. <laughs> two years old, and she's in the car, and she's crying because her mom got her dressed and didn't let her dress herself. And when her father looked back and said, Sissy, why are you crying? She said, because I don't match. I want you to understand that I have experienced that trauma <laughs> ever since that day Debbie has matched everything Amen. take a good look did you not see that look at that notice the sock and the jacket. I've never sat in the back of my car crying I don't match. I have learned some things. As a matter of fact, I, I am, if, if, this, if, if, if I ever stop pastoring here, I may become a runway model because I have learned how to get in and out of clothes quicker than you can imagine. I get dressed and Debbie, no, 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 you can't wear that shirt with that. Wear this. And, well, wait, wait, these pants go back. Man, well, I, well what about, I'm thinking, let me out of here. I know none of you in here can it relate to what I'm talking about, can you? But sometimes we, it's, it, sometimes we just don't make good decisions, do we? We, we? we get upset with the Father's timeline, but there's a reason for a timeline. It's not because the parents are trying to keep something from you. They're trying to prepare you. There's a reason two-year-olds don't get a driver's license. There's a reason you, don't, you can't go out and buy a gun at five. There's a reason behind it. And you may not know the reason, but the Father does. As a matter of fact, let me say it this way, we seldom ever know the reason. We're usually figuring, we're usually sitting there going, I can't believe that they're making me do this. I can't. My dad made me eat peas. Why? Because he felt like it was good for me. Now I love peas. But if I had listened to my own instincts instead of following his instruction, I wouldn't have let him be a part of my life. Let me share a story with you. I heard a story about a young man that got drafted into the majors to play baseball. The team he played for, his position on that team was the DH. He was a designated hitter. And he did his job well. Every time he was called on to, be, to come up to the plate, he delivered, man. I mean, he, he did well. And his career was doing well, and everything was going along fine until he started listening to other people. Here's another life lesson for you. You need to be careful who you give your ear to. Amen. You need to be careful who you're allowing to speak into your life because everybody isn't interested in your good. <laughs> and so they start talking to this young man, and they start telling him, I don't know why he won't let you play a position all the time. You're good. You, you deserve your own position. You ought to be up there all the time batting. And he started listening to this stuff. And he went to the general manager, and he said, look, I, I, I want a position. I, you know, I, and he said, no, no, I, I, there's a reason I've got you where you're at, and, and I'm going to keep you there. So he got aggravated, and when term came out on his contract, he signed with a different team. 
And guess what? On the other team, he's no longer the DH. Now he's the cleanup batter. He's batting fourth. And he's rolling along, man. People are talking about how good he is. And everything's going great until he plays his former team. And when he plays his former team, when he came up to bat, the manager walked out to the mound and he took the ball away from the right-handed pitcher and he brought out a lefty. And he told the left-handed pitcher, pitch him down and away. The first pitch came across down and away and he swung and missed. Second pitch, swung and missed. Third pitch, swung and missed missed. He didn't get a hit that whole game because the manager knew how to pitch him down in a way. Then other teams saw what they were doing, so everybody started pitching him down in a way. And it wasn't long until he lost his position in the majors and got sent back to the minors. Some time passed, and the ball player one day happened to bump into his old coach. And the coach walked up to him and he said, Son, I hope you understand now. I was never trying to restrict you. I was trying to protect you. I never allowed anyone to see your weakness. That's why he was a DH, because he didn't come to the plate enough for them to try different pitches out on him. They didn't know that he couldn't hit a down and away. And do you understand, when the boy left home, he doesn't realize the father's not trying to keep it from him. He's trying to protect him. Yeah. He knew what would happen. And so... Rick, run up here, please. So finally, after lunch with pigs, he starts thinking about home. He starts thinking about his dad. He starts thinking about the place. And he almost allowed embarrassment to keep him from going home. He almost felt like he'd never want me back. I mean, look what I did. I, 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 I demanded his stuff, and then I squandered it all. And my, my, serv my dad's servants eat better than I do. He treats his hired help better than the world has treated me. He says, I... I want to go home because there's no place like home. I thought about that girl in Kansas. <laughs> thought about those ruby slippers that were on her feet. What a lot of you aren't aware of is I, I found this out after first service. My message today wasn't originally going to be called There's No Place Like Home. I had sent it earlier for to Shelly so she wouldn't be able to study before she had to do sign on it. Scriptures are all the same, but my title changed. I was sitting in my office, and I, I, I thought, this doesn't feel right. And then all of a sudden, I, I thought, okay, I've, I've got to change this. After first service, I found out that yesterday, during the Empower Hour, that Shelly walked up to Debbie. I had no clue this happened. Shelly walked up to Debbie and told Debbie, I see ruby slippers on your feet, and there's no place like home. This isn't by chance today, folks. Hear what I'm getting ready to say. That little girl, the provision of the house stopped the enemy cold and then took the wealth of the wicked and gave it to the righteous. Put the ruby slippers on her feet. Hear me. She didn't realize that in her walk, she always had the ability 
to get home. But she kept looking for home in all the wrong places. <laughs> Scarecrow couldn't get her there. Tin Man couldn't get her there. The Lion couldn't get her there. The Wizard couldn't get her there. Killing another witch couldn't get her there. But what she'd been equipped to walk in had the power to get her back home. Somebody better hear what I'm saying. God has equipped you with the right walk if you refuse to leave the place. Don't let the devil talk you out of your place. Because if you walk in the right place, you'll always possess the power to get home. He rehearses it. Maybe. I know, I, I know I'd never be able to be his son. I get that. I, I'm not even shooting for that. I, but maybe he let me work for him. Maybe, maybe he's got a place in the barn I could stay in. At least I would eat. And so he starts back, tears in his eyes, and he sees his father on the porch from a distance. And when his father caught a glimpse of his son, he doesn't sit on the porch anymore. But there's a response from his father that he's not expecting. The father went running to him and started hugging him. And he's telling his dad, Dad, I'm sorry. I'm not worthy to be your son. And his dad's saying, shut your mouth, boy. I don't want to hear talk like that. You listen to me. You bring, get me a calf, kill a calf, bring me a rope in a ring but daddy daddy I, I, I squandered everything you had I see his dad smile let me tell you something I got enough to cover you twice <laughs> yeah. I, do you do you think you really do you think I really gave you all I had son I wasn't about to give you all I had until you got that pig pen stuff out of you yeah. would you stand with me today Aren't you glad for a place of provision? For a father that refuses to throw us away and to know down deep in your heart that there's no place like home. I want to invite you to come home today. Whatever made you wander away, don't let it keep you away. The world will chew you up and spit you out. But the Father will help you get up and straighten you out. He's not restricting you. He's protecting you. Not trying to keep something from you. Trying to get something to you. We need to value His house because it's a place of provision. The reason it's a place of provision is because of whose house it is. <laughs> Everybody say, it's my daddy's house. There's truly no place like home. I want you to hear me today. We're entering into a new season. How, how can I say this? E every year, seasons change you understand every year seasons change now we've all got our favorite seasons right but you don't get to live in your favorite season now here's the thing about seasons that change naturally we know pretty much how long those last right i mean they're marked out on our calendar june 20th or is it the 20th 20th of june summer starts longest day of the year September, autumn begins, December marks winter. We got those pegged out pretty well. But here's the deal. We don't know how long seasons last spiritually. We don't know how long we're going to go through something. We just need to rejoice in the fact that we're going to go through it. <laughs> that we're not going to camp out in it. It's not going to take us down. It's not going to take us out because there's provision in the house and there's no place like home. So this is what I'm asking you today. See, 
I know what it's like to feel the fire and the power of God in my life and then hit a season where I feel like the fire is quenching, that it's not roaring like it used to and, and trying to reach for it and trying to find it and trying to figure out what, what's going on. And I've learned this, I've discovered this, that all that will change as long as I stay in the house. But if I start walking away from his place, if I get away from the house, then I'm not going to discover what it is he's got for me because I've walked away from the one that provides it. There's not a person in here, I, I believe, that there's not a person in here that can raise their hand and make a statement and say, I never once strayed from the Father's house. If you can, I'm going to buy you a trophy. But I'm the guy on the pulpit today and I can't. What I can tell you is there's never been a place that I strayed that he didn't find me. Never a place I walked that he wasn't waiting for me. And I never came back and got rejected. I never came back, no matter how dirty I got, I never came back rejected. But I always came back to open arms. I feel like we ought to kill a calf today. <laughs> Bring out the robe and the ring because the Father wants to wrap his arms around someone on their way back home.